4. The Talk About the Kingdom Since the occasions of Jesus' baptism by John and the turning of the water into wine at Cana, the apostles had, at various times, virtually accepted him as the Messiah. For a short period, some of them had truly believed that he was the expected deliverer. But hardly would such hope spring up in their hearts than the Master would dash them to pieces by some crushing word or disappointing deed. They had long been in a state of turmoil due to conflict between the concepts of the expected Messiah which they held in their minds and the experience of their extraordinary association with this extraordinary man which they held in their hearts. It was late forenoon on this Wednesday when the apostles assembled in Celsus's garden for their noontime meal. During most of the night, and since they had arisen that morning, Simon Peter and Simon Zelotus had been earnestly laboring with their brethren to bring them all to the point of the wholehearted acceptance of the Master, not merely as the Messiah, but also as the divine Son of the living God. The two Simons were well-nigh agreed in their estimate of Jesus, and they labored diligently to bring their brethren around to the full acceptance of their views. While Andrew continued as the director general of the Apostolic Corps, his brother, Simon Peter, was becoming increasingly and by common consent the spokesman for the Twelve. They were all seated in the garden at just about noon when the Master appeared. They wore expressions of dignified solemnity, and all arose to their feet as he approached them. Jesus relieved the tension by that friendly and fraternal smile which was so characteristic of him when his followers took themselves, or some happening related to themselves, too seriously. With a commanding gesture he indicated that they should be seated. Never again did the twelve greet their master by arising when he came into their presence. They saw that he did not approve of such an outward show of respect. After they had partaken of their meal, and were engaged in discussing plans for the forthcoming tour of the Decapolis, Jesus suddenly looked up into their faces and said, Now that a full day has passed since you assented to Simon Peter's declaration regarding the identity of the Son of Man, I would ask if you still hold to your decision. On hearing this, the twelve stood upon their feet, and Simon Peter, stepping a few paces forward toward Jesus, said, Yes, Master, we do. We believe that you are the Son of the living God and Peter sat down with his brethren. Jesus, still standing, then said to the twelve, You are my chosen ambassadors, but I know that, in the circumstances, you could not entertain this belief as a result of mere human knowledge. This is a revelation of the Spirit of my Father to your inmost souls. And when, therefore, you make this confession by the insight of the Spirit of my Father which dwells within you, I am led to declare that upon this foundation will I build the brotherhood of the kingdom of heaven. Upon this rock of spiritual reality will I build the living temple of spiritual fellowship in the eternal realities of my Father's kingdom. All the forces of evil and the hosts of sin shall not prevail against this human fraternity of the divine spirit. And while my Father's spirit shall ever be the divine guide and mentor of all who enter the bonds of this spirit fellowship, to you and your successors, I now deliver the keys of the outward kingdom, the authority over things temporal, the social and economic features of this association of men and women as fellows of the kingdom. And again he charged them, for the time being, that they should tell no man that he was the Son of God. Jesus was beginning to have faith in the loyalty and integrity of his apostles. The Master conceived that a faith which could stand what his chosen representatives had recently passed through would undoubtedly endure the fiery trials which were just ahead, and emerge from the apparent wreckage of all their hopes into the new light of a new dispensation, and thereby be able to go forth to enlighten a world sitting in darkness. On this day the Master began to believe in the faith of his apostles, save one. And ever since that day, this same Jesus has been building that living temple upon that same eternal foundation of his divine sonship, and those who thereby become self-conscious sons of God are the living stones which constitute this living temple of sonship, erecting to the glory and honor of the wisdom and love of the eternal Father of spirits. And when Jesus had thus spoken, he directed the twelve to go apart by themselves in the hills to seek wisdom, strength, and spiritual guidance until the time of the evening meal. And they did as the Master admonished them.